Are there any resources on Mars that are actually more plentiful there than Earth where you might be able to justify the cost of mine there? Is it literally just nothing there unique to the planet that we don't have in planets here on Earth? I don't know of anything unique to the planet. Um, it's difficult to really say because there hasn't been a planet-wide geological survey. I think we really don't know. But I have not seen any numbers on anything that would justify going to Mars to find anything. Just when you're taking in the cost of launching hardware to do it, extract it in that environment, and then send it back. It's just like, yeah, yeah like, like Robert J. Sawyer wrote a novel called Red Planet Blues. And the resource that they find to extract from Mars that's worth going out and mining is, is fossils. That, that fossils become a huge commodity item for the 1%. And so they finance these private missions to go to Mars and dig them up Martian fossils so they can display them on their coffee tables. <laughs> now, I'm curious if, if Mars study or anyone else does, have, have, have there been any types of surveys of either fellows or maybe? It's not as deep as Earth, no. no it's, it's still a gravity well. Right. Yeah, it's still expensive to launch anything out of it. Yeah, it's about a, the gravity well is about a 27th that of Earth. Whereas the yeah, whereas you go to develop the gravity wells are much, much smaller. And the resources the resources available are about the same. The gentleman in the middle? Yeah, going back to what Lobo was saying, they were thinking it seems to be that it might be cracking the bar. Yeah, I think yeah, I agree with that. So, you know, On its way to becoming the belt of Mars. Maybe not those fucking yeah. sounds. So So a lot of the discussion about resources and stuff has to do with the current technologies and things like that. If we were to say find some really cheap energy source, you know, thorium reactors, or you know, really building up a lot of solar panels or something, Mars anything. A very interesting tourist destination. Yeah. So now you can take your weekend you and go the, skiing on Nix Olympia. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be the other. I mean, tourism, if the energy costs were cheap enough, would be you know, one of the reasons to go to Mars. But the energy cost would be definitely have to be cheaper. Time. Yeah. And they are talking about it, like uh, a new drive is going kind to of cut the transit time by, like, by two years. Yeah, they were talking about all kinds of things. But we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah there's a couple that people have been pushing for faster methods quite a bit, including the Russians are going to use a series of spy, uh, excuse me, the Soviets were going to use a series of space hooks that would, uh, uh, would cut the travel time. I knew somebody who wrote a short, but was then about writing a short story at now. Their method of making Mars profitable was to postulate, well, I can't believe you, uh, <laughs> that uh, the antimatter that our current models of the sun predict is streaming out with the uh, solar wind uh, was essentially painting Mars in uh, a um, crystal uh, form that on Earth 
wasn't here because our atmosphere degraded it, but on Mars it was found to uh, be a uh, energy source. A lot of ifs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, the other the other low energy, low resource way to get to Mars is the cycler proposed by Dr. Buzz Aldrin. Yeah, but basically you have one, you have a spacecraft that just constantly goes from Earth to Mars without stopping, and basically picks up and drops off landers as it goes. Yeah. So I mean, but again, still like you have the energy cost versus the, re the expected results is it probably a non-starter. That takes the same time, but it amortizes your cost wonderfully. Yeah. Right. And so you sort of, if, if you want to do this, like. Uh, Cadillac science mission. I mean, like, and it would be worth sending geologists up to Mars. Who wouldn't geologists anymore? But, um, to, to, to check out the, uh, the environment up there to see how it's different from Mars and what we would learn more about us from going there. But uh, other than that, in tourism right now, there's really no good reason to go to Mars. So, any other? What are people's favorite favorite um, images of Mars in, the, in popular culture? Like movies, books, comic books. That's what what inspires you about what has inspired you about Mars that you actually pay attention to it enough to come to this panel, for instance? Oh. I like that beautiful scene in the recent movie Martian where he's uh, about to enter Chaparelli Crater and they show the expansive background of the blue sky, the hills on one side, the uh, vortices in the atmosphere. Uh, I just thought that was a beautiful artistic scene. So spirit and opportunity, wasn't that like a beautiful thing that you could actually see the real, you know, surface? And, and they chugged along for so long. I mean, like, yeah, they, they, started, they made their own movies up there. And yeah, that, that was a biggie, I think. I think. That, in, that Opry, Oppie is still up there producing science, and spirit produced science for quite a long time as well. And now we have curiosity. I think. Uh, and we've had like, I think Mars is also like, it's, it's joy and sorrow at the same time. And we had the, everybody was looking forward to the Beagle has landed and then the Beagle disappeared. <laughs> you know, that probe didn't make it. I think in the early days, I think more, more probes died on the way, on the way to or at Mars than actually landed yeah, successfully. The, the polar lander, the, the what? polar lander, the feet versus the Yeah. But I think in the, in the 70s, we had those two great successes, Viking 1 and Viking 2. Yeah. And um, Viking 2, it was a Viking 2 lasted an incredibly long time. It was like Spirit, Spirit and Oppie. It lasted a lot longer than we thought it would. Yeah. They were each only given a 50-50 chance of landing and according to the original specs. Yeah. They both nailed, nailed the landing. I think, uh, yeah, to me it was those, those Mars movies. And, um, oh, that's right, I was going to bring up an a really interesting example of, in the popular culture is the book by um, Willie Lay, Werner von Braun, and Chesley Bonestell, um, which basically it was like a, a popular book version of von Braun's uh, blueprint for a mission to Mars. And it's got like little pictures of what the spacecraft would look like and what they would need. It was like one big ship and one flying wing ship with the return, return a rocket on it. Like silver Delta wing like thing. Yeah. Big tapered rocket boosters launching out there. Sort of like, uh, and they were, it was all like 1950s level technology. Yeah. Voyage to Mars was called. You can still you can still get a copy of the book, but it doesn't have the pictures. Yeah. But it was probably inspired a lot of people. Sure. Yeah. Well, 1950s. How many people here remember Space Cat? And when that thing he went to Mars, Space Cat beats the two, three, four. Space Cat means Mars. Yeah. Well, there's uh, Lucky Star in the. Uh, yeah. As well as, uh, I guess, the aforementioned Highland Red Planet and Stranger to Strange Lords. Yeah. Plus, plus Burroughs. What else was there? Bradbury. Yeah, Bradbury. Bradbury, yeah. Didn't he do something about, uh, like, there were uh, ships or, or sand riding things on the. On the on the sand of Mars? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Actually, um, more recently, uh, the author of R. Garcia, I. E. Robertson, um, has done a series of, like, it's not Mars, but it's, it's basically Burroughs' Mars type stories. 
bigger planets with better atmospheres, and still like the same kind of societies that sort of thing. So it's still inspiring authors even to this day. Well, so we've learned quite a bit since some of those things. Like with the story about these uh, sails and stuff, I mean, they don't have enough atmosphere to push the sail now, no. right? Is, is that something we've, we'd understand now? Yeah. And they, yeah, because they could see that Mars had an atmosphere of weather, but they didn't realize just how weak that weather was from looking at it from far away. An engineer once described the Martian atmosphere to me as thick enough that you can't ignore it, but too thin to be useful. Yeah. <laughs> So that's the biggest hand wave of the Martian is that that Martian standstorm in the beginning would not have threatened them at all. It would just have been enough force. Yes, sir. So what's the science say now about the uh, evidence of flowing water and potential for uh, at one point there might have been more of an atmosphere before boiled off? I think uh, yes for both. There, there is flowing water on Mars for loose definitions of water. Um, and it did have a lot more water at one time, but because it um, doesn't have a magnetosphere, uh, the solar wind just like blew it all away. So it's been gone for billions of years. So one reason to go over to see if there was any evidence of life on Mars. There still might be life on Mars because it's a um, not not complex life, but definitely there's still like a, um, a wateroid environment for, that they could take advantage of. Although I think the the water is very alkaline and briny. So it doesn't freeze. And it definitely Mars at least it had two different ocean periods in its history. Where like an ocean covered a good chunk of the planet. Yes. Do you know what sort of time scale this kind of occurred? Like how quickly billions of years ago. Billions of years. Okay. Roughly the, the first billion years of life. Uh, the first billion years of Mars existing, that's when it had an atmosphere and oceans and the possibility of life development. All of this subject to new data. And I think um, part of it is they figure that the conditions on Mars, because there's a different gravity level, they, theoretically, Earth um, life could have evolved faster than it did on Earth. Right. Don't, don't be looking for Martian cities. <laughs> Gemstones and diamonds um, were actually were actually hibernating life forms. When oh, when we brought into a richer environment, they, they started they, to grow again. Yeah, they started to grow and they started burrowing into people. So like water bears, something like that. And uh, it was really a yeah, you know, it was really a fun story. So it's I mean, if it's possible for something to hibernate. Maybe there's something there, but uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not playing any podcast <laughs> by any stretch. Of the well, I think we're sort of. A, you guys want to give, give a, a summary statement or observation? I think I think I'll maybe I'll go first. I think to me, like, why we're so fascinated with Mars is because it's like the ultimate manifestation of the other. Um, and I think a couple of examples of this, again from pop culture, are the. Um, my favorite Martian TV show, which a Martian was used to allow us to reflect upon our own society, and uh, the Martian Manhunter character in DC Comics, which is now cropped up again on Superman. And again, he's especially in uh, Darwin Cook's The New Frontier, he's the ultimate immigrant, the ultimate other in our society. The thing for me that really, what the real draw for Mars is, is kind of summed up with uh, something that uh, Dr. Zuber said way back the end, when he's talking about why people would want to go colonize that, and he said that anywhere you go on Earth, the cops are too close. <laughs> it's like, okay. and that's really it for me, being, you know, having a little bit of an anarchist streak, just kind of want to go off somewhere, we'll find try something new, see if it works, and not have, you know, somebody looking over the shoulder ready to Well, if you go to Mars and actually blow up the planet, I mean, <laughs> people on Earth aren't going to be too upset as long as no chance. Yeah. Yeah. Read the space merchants when you get a chance. Space merchants. Get out. And 
I think thanks to uh, Lalo and Sharp Rally, I think Mars is always going to have a mystical hold on us. There. The idea that once we thought there was a civilization on Mars, so that we never get that idea is never going to go away. Always going to have that mystical hold on us. Until we put a civilization on Mars. Yeah. That someday that civilization might be us. Well, it, it, it did exist. All this evidence to the contrary is just a uh, big conspiracy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, if we go into conspiracies, I've read things saying that we all. Uh, we have already had the CIA with teleportation technology gone to Mars, and Obama himself has been. He's probably uh, born there. Cameron <laughs> Mitchell went there in the next 302 and picked up the face so that we wouldn't be asking questions about it. Sam blasted down. I that. I think it was like, what was it? There was that um, experimental film on the, on, the, on the internet where the space curve. A spacecraft crashes in northern Alberta, and there's a, a young man on board speaking Rush, only Russian. Pioneer One. Pioneer, it's called Pioneer One. And basically, what the, the premise is the Soviets sent a one way mission to Mars as colonists, and, they, and he's the guy that managed to come back. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Uh,